Chapter 2 First, however, you must know about my brother. At 17 years of age, William was 5 foot 9, with a lean face and bright eyes that seemed to want to observe everything. Such were his high spirits and boundless curiosity that father referred to him, with a smile, as our young fox. The natural leader of many friends, William was determined to become a lawyer, a profession my parents encouraged. Once, he even confided to me that his goal was nothing less than to become governor of the New York colony. In short, he was the family heir, name and hope, our entire future. I was certain there was nothing he could not do. Not only was William an early believer in our country's independence, he favored the abolition of slavery and thought women should be educated. Thus, it was William, not my parents, who took time to teach me my letters and how to write. Not only did I learn to read well and fast, he said my understanding and memory were excellent. Whereas Mother believed such education would diminish my chance of marriage, William proclaimed, Only a man who can esteem Sophia's intelligence is worthy of her beauty. What sister could not adore such a brother? While William was an early follower of the radical Mr. Thomas Paine, Father was of a more traditional bent. They would debate for hours at a time and enjoyed it. I tried to follow and, you may be sure, took William's side. That said, the many swirling disputes and political events of 1776 were not fully understood by me. With patience, William tried to educate me. He talked, taught, and catechized me endlessly about our rights, freedoms, and natural liberties. He read me Mr. Paine's Common Sense in its entirety. Hardly a wonder that I considered my elder brother the source of all wisdom. Let it be said that I, despite my age, could give an earnest defense of our rightful freedoms. In September 1775, William began attending King's College. How proud I was to see him in his smart new black suit and cocked hat with a volume of John Locke's a letter concerning toleration, a gift from father, tucked under his arm. He soon became friends with other young radicals, including Alexander Hamilton. For some time, but especially during 1775 and into 1776, there had been turmoil in New York City. Disturbances and violent clashes erupted between those who supported the British monarchy, people labeled them Tories or Loyalists, and those who, like my brother and me, believed passionately that our liberties were being stolen by that great brute, Mr. Payne's words, King George III and his Parliament. The defenders of our rights, like William and his friends, called themselves patriots. My own friends and I did no less. The Boston Massacre... The battles of Lexington, Concord, and Bunker Hill made the discord in New York more intense and brought on riots. To the far north, Fort Ticonderoga was captured by the Patriots Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold. They removed the cannons and dragged them on sleds across New England, where they were used to liberate Boston. Patriots everywhere rejoiced, none more so than I did. Nonetheless, pro-British Tories remained in charge of the city. Red-coated British troops marched out of Fort George and tried to suppress what they called the mob, the group that called itself the Sons of Liberty. Williams College was closed. As a result, he became ever more active in politics and marched with the local militia. As he paraded by, I stood near the road and cheered. In the spring of 1776, Patriot soldiers, led by General Charles Lee, came into town and simply took over. They forced the Loyalists to give way. Then, George Washington and his Continental troops entered New York. 
When they arrived, many Tories, including the mayor, fled to safer havens along the Hudson Valley, to Long Island, Charleston, even to London. William took me down to Bowling Green by Fort George and pointed out British ships of war which lay anchored in the city's lower bay. That's where many of the Tory cowards have fled, he told me. Onto those ships. Never mind that the ships bristled with guns. But with the dispersal of the Tories, it was as though the plague had come to New York. The city became strangely vacant of citizens. Houses closed, shops locked. As Patriot soldiers prepared for the inevitable British attack, the town became a military camp. Many of our beautiful trees were chopped down so fortifications could be erected. Barricades were built. Few water vendors were to be seen on the streets. Merchant ships remained tied up at the wharfs, their sails furled like folded arms. Trade by land and sea, the true life of the town, all but ceased. I was pleased to inform my anxious parents that we patriots could not fail to prevail. Then, in late June, an immense British fleet arrived and anchored in the Narrows, just off Staten Island. William took me to Fort George again, from where I saw a vast forest of masts. He gazed at the formidable threat. I promise you, he told me, liberty shall always triumph over tyranny. I had not a single doubt that he was right. It was about then that he, at the urging of his good friend John Paulding, joined George Washington's army. So it was that just before that Brooklyn battle, William and John Paulding marched bravely away, muskets on their shoulders, sprigs of green in their hats in lieu of real uniforms, sure that our soldiers, including my brother and his friend, would protect us. I cheered them off with pride. Then, on August 22nd, in Brooklyn, more than 15,000 English and German troops attacked. Our soldiers were utterly defeated. Many were killed. As many as 2,000 patriots were taken prisoner. Only a deft stratagem and a thick fog allowed General Washington to bring his reduced army back to Manhattan Island. As one who could recite the crimes the British had committed, the one cited in our independence declaration. I never considered that such a defeat could happen. Were not patriots in the right? Would not God himself favor us? Was not our cause just? Was not my brave brother there? When news of the defeat spread, as the patriot army fled through and away from the city, we patriots were greatly alarmed. I needed William to return, and his friend too, Mr. Paulding. We waited as long as it was deemed prudent. Then, Father said we must find safety. Shortly after we left, the fire erupted that destroyed a quarter of the town's buildings. The British claimed American rebels set it, and were on the lookout for arsonists and spies. Thus it came to be that Captain Nathan Hale, in regular life a schoolteacher in Connecticut, was taken. Captured on Long Island, Hale was tricked into revealing that he was a spy for General Washington. He was hauled into town where the British Lord General Howe, head of the British Army, condemned him to be hung the next day. That, to my everlasting horror, is what we witnessed. Dear reader, I beg you, do not forget that Captain Hale was hung for being a spy. Over time, these consequences were enormous for me. At that time, when American expectations were so badly bent, you may well understand my chief concern was William. But I beg you not to misunderstand. I was still a passionate, if young, patriot. Chapter 3 
After witnessing Captain Hale's death, Mother and I, too numb to speak, continued into town. Passing Fresh Pond and then the Commons, we saw countless military tents. English soldiers, fully armed and in red uniforms, formed a sea of scarlet. German troops, many of whom bore fierce moustaches, were in their green uniforms. Scott troops were in their kilts. We passed the new prison, called Bridewell. Though not fully built, men were being marched in. Prisoners, Mother murmured. I prayed that William was still with General Washington. On city streets, we saw that cobblestones had been pulled up. Barricades remained. As we reached Broadway, we began to grasp the great devastation wrought by the fire. Even beautiful Trinity Church was destroyed. Its gigantic steeple of 175 feet, its roof, and all within were gone, including a fine organ and library. The church building stood like part of its own forlorn cemetery. Misery was everywhere. Tattered, soot-smudged citizens, reduced to beggary, poked through the wreckage of homes, searching amidst scorched wood, blackened red bricks, and charred cedar roof shingles. The stench was awful. Greatly agitated, Mother and I, holding our dresses up to avoid the mud, all but ran down Broadway. I gained some assurance when I saw that the east side of Broadway, our side, appeared for the most part intact, the spaced apart houses unharmed. Nevertheless, gardens, usually so splendid in September, were choked with ash and weed. Imagine our joy when we reached Wall Street and saw that our small, two-story wooden house was unscathed. Even better, the door was open. Perhaps William was home. We rushed inside. Alas, no one was there. Moreover, much was in shambles, with some furniture destroyed, dishes smashed, and our four pewter plates gone. The old brass candlestick, a family heirloom of a hundred years, had disappeared from the mantel. As for the food we left in storage, nothing remained. Mother went right to the hearth, stepped within, reached high, and pulled down the small iron chest Father had hidden. Opening it, she found our little hoard, twelve English sixpence, an English shilling, four crown pieces, plus two Spanish reales, Relief showed on Mother's face. Then I found an overlooked candle box. We would have some light. But when we examined Father's workplace at the back of the house, we found much of it in disarray. Father was a scrivener, a copier of legal documents, as well as a copy editor for the newspaper publishers, both Mr. Rivington, publisher of the Gazette, and Mr. Gain, publisher of the Mercury. Many of Father's treasured books, his Johnson Dictionary, his Pope, Locke, Richardson, his adored Robinson Crusoe, lay torn and broken. Spilled ink made frozen shadows on the floor. Quills lay scattered, like a bird ripped apart. Mother latched the front door and said, At least we have our home and savings. And William, I insisted. Though I knew Mother was in great anxiety about him, too, all she said was, We can only pray for good news. Then, after a painful sigh, a better reflection of her feelings, she said, We best try to put things in order. I found some ease in doing something useful. We were still cleaning when a harsh pounding came upon our door. Hoping it was one of our neighbors, I hastened to open it. Standing before the house was a troop of five British soldiers, all armed.